Well, hey, everybody, it's Dr. Phil, but of course you know that. We are live today on my YouTube channel and Facebook. And uh, look, I haven't done um, a podcast, uh, a fresh podcast content for a while because I've had it on um, hiatus for a while. I've been doing some uh, highlights from prior podcasts because I've waited until today when I have relaunched fill in the blanks because I wanted to launch it at the same time I launched the new network, Merritt Street Media. And so today I've launched Merritt Street Media and I'm relaunching fill in the blanks. And look, you've known me for getting straight to the point, using facts, research, and a bit of tough love to guide the way. Uh, And now I do that every night on my new show, Dr. Phil Primetime. Uh, from the, the grip of social media to the trials of modern parenting. We're not shying away from anything. Look, it, it's high time we, we face these challenges together. Uh, with practical advice, you can apply directly to your life. I want to give you television you can use. I don't want to just talk about things in some theory I've always said I want to talk about things that matter to people who care, and those things have changed. So what I'm talking about is changing. So if you're ready for some real talk that's as insightful as it is actionable, then you want to make Dr. Phil Primetime your nightly destination on Merritt Street Media. Remember, it's your life, and it's about time we start addressing what truly matters. So tune in to Dr. Phil Primetime every night on Merritt Street Media. Don't miss out. Uh, Your journey to confronting and overcoming life's challenges starts right here. Go to MerrittStreetMedia.com to find your local channels. Now, let's get to what we're talking about today. In too many instances, uh, we've gotten rid of the most important American trait, and that's self-determination and replaced it with victimization. Uh, We've gotten rid of conversation and replaced it with cancellation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Here with me today is one of my best friends ever. Uh, This is a great man. And when I say that he is a true friend, we talk about things between us that we don't talk about with anybody else. Uh, Just the two of us have closed door conversations that, boy, would you like to be a fly on the wall? (laughs) Uh, And maybe today we'll talk about some of those things, not all, but some of those things. This is a friend that knows the true meaning of those words that we've been talking about. And from identifying his purpose at a very young age, carving out his life's philosophy of you have to dream big and believe that you will succeed to taking a leap of faith into comedy, Steve Harvey has become one of the most recognizable names and faces not just in America, but in the entire world. He's an Emmy award-winning entertainer, radio personality, motivational speaker, New York Times bestselling author, businessman, philanthropist, and an esteemed member of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity um, uh, and the first international fraternal organization founded on the campus of a historically black college. Now, these are the Steve Harvey facts, and together we're diving into creating success in your life, your community, your state, and really importantly, our country. So I want to welcome back to my podcast live today, live, Steve, that's a warning, live, (laughs) I want to welcome back my great friend, Steve Harvey. Steve, Yeah. here we go. Smoking. That was great. Who was that guy? I don't know. I was listening to that intro. I was going, I want to go see him. <laughs> yeah, don't you though? <laughs> yeah, man. How you been? I've been well. How about yourself? Man, I'm I'm my life is shining, man. It's but just shining. Do you do you seriously, do you ever sit back and take a a a, a pause and look at where your life is now and reflect back on where it's come from and think how in the world did I get here? Man, 
I, 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 I can't count the times I've done it. It's just, uh, it's amazing to me. I really, I, man, my life is filled with so much favor and it, but it's been filled with so much hardship and so many tribulations and trials, man. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see how I was going to get here. And then when I look around, when I take a moment, like you say, to pause and look at where I am, I'm just, I'm, I'm amazed by it all. You know, I, I got some steps to my, to my front door at my house. And when I pull up at night and I pull my car in front of them steps, it's 33 steps up to my front door. It's 11 steps, then it's a platform, 11 more platform landing, and then 11 more, and there's a door. And I call them the, my thank you Jesus steps. Because when I'm going up them steps, man, I thank him the whole time I'm walking up the steps. Now, keep in mind now, this is the end of the night. I'm beat. I done done a full radio show that day. I done done a full day of family feud and you're on your feet all day. And I'm walking up them steps. And, it's, and I call them the thank you Jesus steps. And I say it every time because the house I live in, I actually, I actually profess that house. I got halfway up those steps and turned around and looked back at the fountain. And I said, man, one day, one day, I'm going to get a fountain like that in front. Because I was visiting a buddy of mine at that house. Really? Yeah. And I, and, and I stopped and I turned around. He said, man, stop acting crazy. Come on. I said, man, you got to be kidding me, man. And... That's the house I live in today. But you used to visit that house. I used to visit that house. I saw the house when it was being built. I was, I was a part of it. And I saw that house when it was being built. And I told my wife, I said, one day, and she told me, she said, Steve, not this house. It, it, we can't do this. We're going to downsize when the kids move. Well, I ain't never believed in downsizing. I don't no. know what downsizing is for because I don't know how you get God to give you more and then you give it back. I ain't never been into that. Like, I don't do cutbacks. That just ain't my thing. I, I had a guy on my show, uh, uh, Clark Howard, and this ain't nothing negative, but just he's just on the show, just kept telling everybody how to cut back. You know, cut your cable off, save money, instead of driving your car to work, carpool. And I sat there for about a month, and I listened to that, and I just couldn't take it no more, because he, I, I, I'm, I ain't in the cutback business. I'm in, I'm in the if God bless me, I like to keep the blessing. So I, I I don't really cut back. And my wife told me we was gonna downsize. And that was the first major argument we ever had because I'm not in the downsizing business. Yeah, that doesn't seem like your personality. I don't see why, Philly. I really don't see yeah. why I would. What's the crummiest place you've ever lived? I mean, you you think back to the, can you think of the crummiest place you've ever lived? Yeah, my car. Yeah, what yeah. kind of car was it? A Tempo. A tempo. Ford tempo. A Ford tempo. Yeah. I don't suppose it was new. Oh no, new. That would have been nice. Now, I lived in that, and I lived in a Bonneville. I had two cars. I lived in both of them. That was the worst place. I, when I think back at the poorest place I've lived is a house I grew up in. But at the time, I didn't know that. It was par for the course. It was one of the houses on the block. Everybody lived like that, so I thought it was. I thought this is how you live. You have 13 people in one bathroom. And you know, I thought that was it. But. but Because you didn't know any different at the time. No. Because I was saying, well, I grew up poor, but at, at the time, if, if you've never ridden in anything but a 58 Volkswagen, <laughs> if you've never been in a Cadillac, you don't know the difference, <laughs> right? You don't know you got a bad deal. You just think this is the way it is. Hey, we went to church in a 1968 Bel Air station wagon. And that was my first car. In 75, my daddy gave me a 1968 Bel Air station wagon. That was yeah. my first car. Yeah. Yeah, it was the car I went to church in. So. Hey, you were born in West Virginia. Yeah. And uh, it, it was, uh, it, that was not a, 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 a real affluent time in your life, but there were seven of y'all, right? Yeah. How, how many kids were in your family? It was five kids. Five kids, seven yeah, Mom and daddy was yeah, seven. There yeah. were seven in the family. Yeah. Did everybody... Uh, work and contribute when you were growing up? Yeah, that, that was a must. <laughs> you know, wasn't no free rides in my daddy's house. He didn't, Yeah. you know, like, you know, when you, 
like we didn't have allowance and stuff like that. We had to work. We had to. I've had a, I've had paper routes and, and and pop bottle hustles ever since I was ten. Now I want to tell you about my two dogs, Blue and Einstein. Blue and Einstein are really important to me. I mean, I hang with them every day. They're just great companions. And keeping my pet healthy and happy is an absolute priority. They're just like family members. And your pet is one of a kind, and so is their journey through this life. Now, ASPCA Pet Health Insurance Programs offers customizable accident and illness plans, making it easier for pet parents like you to help your pet get the care they may need. It's simple. Use their app to submit a claim, and you'll receive reimbursement for eligible vet bills directly into your bank account. To explore coverage, visit ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash Phil. That's ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash Phil. Again, that's ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash Phil. This is a paid advertisement. Insurance is underwritten by either Independence American Insurance Company or United States Fire Insurance Company and produced by PTZ Insurance Agency Limited. The ASPCA is not an insurer and is not engaged in the business of insurance. The first page of a book never tells the full story. And those news alerts and headlines, like the ones we get on our phones, don't even scratch the surface of what the story is really all about. Stories are like people, multi-layered and complex. It takes some digging to find the truth, but when we find it, it can change our world. We like to dig. The news on Merritt Street, essential television. So you know, I, I've wondered many times if that's the reason you and I got along so well so fast, because I, we've talked about this before, and I threw paper routes. Mm-hmm. I picked up pop bottles, and you mm-hmm. know, you'd get a nickel for some, and you'd get a dime for others, yeah. and put them together. And um, we've had some of those same experiences. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I would not want my kids to go through that. But I don't mind that I did. I, I mean, it's okay with me that I, I went through that at the time. I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and I wouldn't want my kids to do it. But. I, I I don't I, I don't regret it. No, I mean you know look man it it made us who we were. I mean you know you you look at everything you've gone through. I used to oftentimes question God all the time, man. Why is my life like this? You know, as I got older, when I was a kid, it wasn't a question. This was what it was. But when I got older and homeless and all like that, I used to ask God, what is this about, man? I mean, look, come on, enough is enough. But everything you're going through. It's preparing you for what's to come. You and I needed the pop bottle moments, the paper routes. You and I needed that so we could become who we are. Now, we grew up, and we don't want our children to have that, so we work doubly hard so they don't have to go through the same things that we went through. And then that's that's a challenge I find for a lot of people who are doing better now because you give so much to your kids that they miss some of them valuable lessons that you had to learn along the way. And then you start thinking to yourself, well, did I give them too much? What's the cutoff point? And, you know, I wrestle with that all the time with my kids because my kids didn't, didn't fight on the way. My kids went to school with a jacket that had a patch on it, you know, with the blue shirt and uniforms. And yeah. they got demerits. Yeah. And they went to detention. You know, when it was over with for me, School was over with for me. My detention and demerit was somebody had a demerit waiting on me in the playground. Yeah. Cause when the bell rang, I'm kicking, you know, some tail and yours is it today. Yeah. Well, my kids didn't have to go through that because yeah. they had a room with a bathroom in it. They own bathroom. Yeah, their own bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I uh, one of the things that you told me a uh, long time ago. We actually talked about it on. on on microphone one time that has stuck with me and I, I've told a lot of people about it, but you you had, when, when you got older and got out into comedy, you, you told me about what you called your turn back moment when you, you were living in an addict and it, it, it was a turn back moment that, I, and and I wish you would talk about that a little bit because 
it seems to me that you were within hours of having to go back home and get back into an hourly job um, instead of going to the Apollo. Because, you know, look, man, I've said it before. Everybody, I don't care who you are, is going to have that turn back moment. Everybody is on path, on track to a destination. Everybody. Everybody has a dream. Everybody. Nobody is without dreams and visions. But somewhere along that dream or vision, you're going to have a moment where you can either continue or you turn back. The sad truth of the matter is too many people turn back. And my turn back moment was I was out there doing comedy. I was homeless. Uh, It wasn't going good, man. And I just had had enough that day. And I was uh, washing up in a hotel and I was in there and I used to I used to go to fancy hotels to wash up because they had uh, actual uh, washcloths rolled up in a little basket. Yeah. And uh, I used to wet them and take them in the toilet and put soap all over my body. Then I wait till the coast was clear and I go out and rinse them out and go back in there and wipe (laughs) off and then put my clothes on. And that was my bath. Well, that morning. Uh, a uh, convention was in town, and when I got the soap, I went in there to soap up. A convention was in town, and I guess they had let out for a break, and people just kept coming in the bathroom, and I'm sitting there, and I got this soap on me, and it's drying, and I can't get back out there to to get no wesh, no, get get no fresh cloths to wash off, and the soap is drying on me, and I flipped the toilet lid down, and I sat there. I just started crying. I said, this is it, man. I just can't do this no more. This comedy thing ain't working out. I ain't making enough money to take care of my family. <sighs> I'm going to call my father. Because my father told me, once you leave here, you can't come back home. I'm going to call my old man and just cut a deal with him, see if he'll let me come back home for six months and get me a regular job. And let me give up on this comedy thing. And so when the bathroom finally cleared out, I was able to wash off. I went to get in the car, and before I called my daddy, I had an answering machine up in the attic at my mother and father's house. They let me plug up, and I called that answering machine, and uh, I was just about to give up, and I said, uh, I called the machine, and it said, hey, this is Chuck Sutton from Showtime at the Apollo. I saw a tape of you, and I was wondering if you could make it to New York on Sunday and I'll put you on TV. Uh, you're a funny guy. Hope to hear from you. Click. Now, this was a Thursday. I'm in uh, Pensacola, Florida. I got $35. And the Apollo Theater's in Harlem, New York. I got no way I'm going to make this gig. I'm, I'm going to be able to get there. And all of this time, man, I've been wanting to be on TV since I was a kid. Here's this TV moment, and I can't even get there. And man, I was devastated. I said, God, look at this got to be a sign from God show enough to give up now because I get the one crack to be on TV and I can't even get there. So I sat down in the car, man, and tears is just coming down my face, man. I'm just sitting here going, I said, man, let me go and call my father. And I went back and I said, man, let me call and make sure he didn't say this Sunday. And I called back, hey, this is Chuck Sutton from Showtime at the Apollo. Man, I saw your tape. You're a really funny guy. I got to open it on Showtime at the Apollo Sunday night. If you can make it, please give me a call. Man, you're a funny guy. Click. I said, I'll be doggone. It's this Sunday. And I was about to hang up. And, you know, the old-fashioned machines, it said, boop, it beeped again. So I picked up the phone. He said, hey, Steve Harvey. This is Tom Sobel from the Comedy Caravan. I don't know where you are, but I got a gig in Jacksonville, Florida that pays 150 bucks. If you can get there, the gig is Friday night. I'll pay you 150 bucks. Let me know. I called Tom Sobel and said, man, I can get there. So I got there Friday night. I made the 150 bucks I performed. I was so good, the club owner said, hey, can you stick around tomorrow night? I'll pay you another 150. I got $300 now. I get on that phone and I call Showtime and Apollo Chuck Sutton. I say, hey, man, you still got that opening? He said, yeah, I got that opening, man. I said, I'll be there. Eastern Airlines was in business back then. It cost $99 fly from <laughs> Jacksonville to 
uh, New York. I caught a $99 flight, my first time ever on TV, Showtime at the Apollo. I still got the shirt. I still got the tape. I walked out. I got a standing ovation. I'm backstage. I'm crying. I can't stop crying. I done been on TV. And I thought about it. And the reason I couldn't stop crying, because two days ago, I was finna turn back. Two days ago, I was finna call my daddy and give up. Two days ago, had that, had that happened, I'm not here talking to you today. And that turn back moment, man, that, that gave me the faith and the understanding of really how God works. See, if you quit, it'll never happen for you. But if you hang in there, you don't know when God going to flip the switch. And he flipped the switch right because he saw me finna call. He knew I was serious. He said, this, this dude finna give up. Let me rescue him. But he had orchestrated the whole thing. And I didn't turn back. And that moment changed my life. Because when I got on TV, on Showtime the Apollo, that was the beginning of everything. Man, I've been on TV ever since. Yeah. But you ha you hung in. I mean, you hung in and d you, you you didn't do it. You 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 hung and that 300 bucks, you could have taken that and gone home. No, I did that. Yeah. But you know, man, that that's what I say to people all the time. Quitting guarantees you one thing. It ain't going to happen. Yeah. That's the guarantee of quitting. Hanging in there resides this little thing that's required. All you need is a ch the hope, the hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. All you Just hope. That's all faith is. It's just really hope. And the harder you hope, <laughs> the more faith you got. Hey, faith ain't nothing but hard hoping, yeah. you know. But you got to put a lot of elbow grease with it too. And I, I want to ask you. Well, let me let's take a quick break, and then I've got to ask you a question that plays right into what you're saying. Um, I, let me do a commercial here, and it's about uh, something I want to tell you that Steve and I have in common here in just a minute. Um, and uh, I'm going to do a shameless plug again for Merritt Street Media because it is a new network where the rubber meets the road. Uh, this isn't just a new network. It is a revolution in common sense television, and it is straight from the heart of America to you. Uh, now, look, this is a network that's founded on the principles of meritocracy, and that's just what you heard Steve Harvey talking about before we took this break. Meritocracy, rewarding hard work, rewarding hanging in there, and it's the spirit of Main Street. Uh, we're here to deliver content that speaks to you, about you, and for you. And Dr. Phil Primetime is just the beginning. Uh, we're rolling out the red carpet for shows that cover every angle of life as we know it, from family and relationships to the burning issues that are shaping our world today. And if you're ready for television that's as real as you are, it's time to tune in uh, to Merritt Street Media, because this is just our story. This, is, this isn't just our story to tell. It's yours, too. This isn't just my network. This is our network. Let's make television that matters, and let's make it together. Dis I, I want you to discover a whole new era in television with Merritt Street Media. Uh, this isn't like a lot of other networks where you know, there's, a, there's one show, and then you go to the next show, and they don't have anything to do with each other. We've created a whole new ecosystem here where the news is involved with my show, and my show is involved with Nancy Grace's show, and Nancy Grace's show is involved with uh, the behavior panel. I mean, all the shows are involved with each other, and Steve Harvey is going to have something to say about that in a few minutes, I bet. Uh, so to get involved, go to MerrittStreetMedia.com to find your local channels. There's a channel finder there, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a passion for me, and I think when you tune in, you're going to see why. But I don't want you to just tune in. I want you to call everybody you know um, and tell them about it. Uh, I've written a new book called We've Got Issues, How to Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity, and it is the blueprint 
for this entire network. It's a blueprint for our news. It's a blueprint for Dr. Phil Primetime. It's a blueprint for everybody involved in this network because we have shared values. And um, I think you'll share them too uh, when you tune in. Lauren, we are sisters. That's true. And we host a celebrity-obsessed podcast called Pop Apologists. We also love Taylor Swift. Chandler, how are you managing to cope while we await Taylor's new album? Look, I want to be put into a medically induced coma and wake up on April 19th, but I'm not sure my insurance is going to cover it. Join us on our pop culture podcast, Pop Apologists, where we will be dishing on all things celebrity news and deep diving every word and note of Taylor's new album. Pop Apologists. Pop Apologists. Now, you know, Steve, you were talking about faith being uh, just hoping real hard, but you, you put action with that too. And you, you said you wouldn't be sitting here today uh, if it wasn't for that. You and I have been friends for a long time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, man. and I said before, we talked about some things that <laughs> we can't really talk about with anybody else because there aren't very many people that do what we do. Right. I mean, we're both out there every day. We're in people's homes every day. Right. People feel like they know us because mm-hmm. we're in their home every day. You're in my home almost all day, every day. Right? I mean, I, I think you were at my house one time, and I pulled up the, the record guide. Uh, I think we had, what, 430 episodes of Family Feud recorded <laughs> yeah. in a row? Yeah. Because Robin just records them all Yeah. and, and watches them all. Um, and, you know, people see you, and, I mean, you're, you, you have a great gift for humor and banter with people. You go back and forth with them. Um, that's why Family Feud is, it, it's got to be the most successful game show like that uh, of ever. I mean, I, I don't know if anything else has had the longevity you've brought to it, the energy, mm-hmm. uh, everything that you've you've brought to it, uh, because you're just authentic with the people, right? Yeah. I mean, you don't, mm-hmm. you, you don't really know, you don't have a clue what you're going to say when you walk out there because you don't know what they're going to say. Right. You just let yourself kind of come through. And that's a big part of all the comedy you've ever done. I've, I've seen your stand up. I've seen your concerts. I've seen, uh, everything you do and you have comedy that you work out where the beats are timed and they're exactly what they need to be. But a big part of it is you just interacting with the audience. Where do you get the confidence to do that? I don't know if it's the confidence as more so it's just though. I mean, look, man, authenticity is a big part of our brand, mine and yours. I think that's a big part of our friendship over the years is authenticity. I couldn't believe it was another dude in the business that was just a real dude. and You couldn't believe it was another dude in the business that was just a real dude because you know what we run up into out here. Oh, yeah. You know, you got your brand manager, you got your PR person, you got your attorney, you got all these people being stuff that they're told to be. You ain't never been that, and I ain't never been that. I'm, you know, I, I had, they call me a country bumpkin and all like that. Well, what you? I'm from Welch, West Virginia. What you want me to be? Yeah. Well, what 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 you want me to do? You know, you can't. I, I'm not finna speak grammatically correct. I got high school diploma. That was it. Graduating class of 695. I graduated 690. Yeah. <laughs> so you weren't at the bottom. No, no, no. And them five people out after me, I gave them the blues when I saw them too. I tried to encourage them, you know, hang in there, dog. It'll be all right. <laughs> you could, 694 is right around the corner. You know, <laughs> I tried to build them up, man. But I, it was, it was an authenticity, man. I just can't fake the funk, man. I don't, I don't like that. I, I can't hold the line, you know what I mean? If I'm out here faking, man, I'm not gonna be able to hold the line. I ain't gonna be, I already know that, cause the real me gonna come out. See, I, it's sort of funny, man. Like, if I don't like you, I, I just I just stay on the other side. And just, me and you don't need to talk, cause it's gonna come out, cause I'm not gonna be able to hide the fact that I don't care for you. Cause the moment you say something contrary to what I wanna hear, then here it come. I'm going to let you have it right in the teeth. And, 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 and I've always been that way. So I've just wanted to stay authentically me. And I think people respond to that. I know that's why you've been on TV for so long, man. I told you, but my favorite moment on TV, I was watching you on TV talk to this guy. 
and you were just frustrated with this dude, and he was just whining. I don't want to, I don't want to. And you just say, "Hey, man, you just you gonna have to man up." And I went, "Okay." Oh, er, you could feel the brakes going. Er, you just saw. <laughs> I went, "Okay." That he gonna get some calls on that one right there. You finna get it's a lot of emails coming in. Doctor Fielding insulted him by telling him he needed to man up. Well, really, man. That made all the sense in the world to me. And that's pretty much how I try to be. When I turn that corner at Family Feud, like you said, I never met these people. I don't know who they are. I try to be relatable. But if I can't relate, I'm just going to tell you that part, too. You know, it was um, it, it was interesting to me uh, in, in watching that unfold, because if you remember, um, you and Marjorie were at our house the night you had to make the decision of whether to do Family Feud or not. Yeah. Uh, wow. You were thinking about it, talking about it. We were back in my office discussing wow. it. Yeah. And um, it, it, that was the night. you. It, it was a deadline. You had to tell them whether you are going to do it or not. Yeah. And they were pushing you hard. And we talked about the fact that, you know, the, the, the game show, the game part of it, you know, that's part of it. it like you said, it's a survey. Uh, but it gave you a chance to just be you. Yeah, uh, the game's just a backdrop. It was just a, it was just a platform for you to be who you are, and let them keep score. You just go down <laughs> the line, and you just—it's like you work in the front row of a comedy show, bro. That's all it is, you know, man. Family Feud, a huge part of its success is, I, I turned it into a comedy show exactly. instead of a game, and nobody had ever done that with a game show. A game show has a set format, and that's it. Family Feud is a, a game about a survey. Top 100 people survey said, hear what they think. Well, who care? I mean, you know, and, and I'll I tell you what was making me have that trouble at your house that night. They had sent me a tape of the guy before me. And the question was, they sent me a tape for me to see the show. Name your favorite pet. And the guy said, a cow. And the host said, well, let's see if it's up there. <laughs> and I said to myself, the hell are you talking about? Well, what do you mean, let's see if it's up there? Cow. You ain't said dog, puppy, cat, chicken, fish, bird, turtle. You know, stuff people got. Who got a cow walking around their living room? And I said, well, I said, so why would I do that? The lady said, you would say that to the contestant? Yeah, I'm not going to turn and say, let's see if it's up there. Now, first of all, I know it ain't up there. And that's secondly, let's find out why you thought that ignorant answer would be up here. She said, you can't make disparaging remarks against the country. Yeah, watch me. <laughs> I said, lady, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, what you bring me down here for? You know who I am. You seen my tapes. I don't make disparaging remarks. Lady, I'm an observational humorist expert. I made an observation that you said a stupid answer. What I do is, I now say what everybody at the house is thinking. And that's what I did. And, and man, they told me that won't happen. I said at your house that night, I said, Philly, I don't know, man. And you told me, you said, man, why don't you just go in there and be you? Yeah. And I said, okay. And then I took the gig and that was it. Yeah, that was it. Seven Emmy, seven time Emmy winner. Uh, New York Times, number one best-selling author, Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man, 64 times on the New York Times bestseller list, mm -hmm. 23 of those at number one, two Marconi Awards for radio, 14 NAACP Image Awards, BET Humanitarian Award. I know you got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame because I gave it to you. Yes, sir. Yes, um, uh, People's Choice Award, yeah. uh, induction into the National Association of Broadcasters Hall of Fame. Yeah. Uh, you, you've taken that authenticity, and it's obvious people respond to that. All that. From a country bumpkin. All that from a country <laughs> bumpkin. A ball-headed country bumpkin. You stupid hick. <laughs> okay. I ain't even going to tell you how many trips down to the bank I made. We'll, uh, we'll leave that alone. You just laugh all the way to the bank. Bro, country hey man, bumpkin. Let me tell you something. Hey, man, somebody asked me one time. They said, Steve, how come you don't respond to the haters? Listen, man, <laughs> first of all, 
Haters don't stop nothing. They are not decision makers, power brokers. They don't stop nothing, man. And they don't pay your rent. Bruh. <laughs> and and, and I mean, I've mean, i learned so many things. Do you know what I've known? And you, you've noticed, and this is for everybody watching. You've never, ever had a hater that was doing better than you. Yep. No doubt about ever. it. Ever. All Nor one haters. that wouldn't change places with you in a heartbeat. Bruh. <laughs> so when people talk about, man, why don't you respond? I wish I would. <laughs> to stop and take my light and shine it on your little bitty self. You an ant cutting across the, cutting across the cornfield. Yeah. Bruh, you go head on. You ain't even corn. So I wish I would stop. Man, I don't have no problem. Matter of fact, now, you know, man, I'm so battle tested with the internet now. You know, me and you was talking about that and uh, how TikTok is running the airwaves now. And the reason I know about TikTok, because I work with a lot of young people. Yeah. <laughs> and they world is TikTok. One of them sitting over there right there. He's the TikTok king. He's the king of TikTok. <laughs> All of his news come from TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> well, then you know it's right. <laughs> if he, you come from TikTok, you know it's right. Bro, he done been on about eight diet plans off TikTok. Yeah. Yeah, been at work where we couldn't find him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he, he, here's the thing, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell people this, and then you can tell them why. Uh, we've been talking about Merritt Street Media, the new network that we launched today, which is why we're celebrating with uh, kicking the uh, Fill in the Blanks podcast back off with this live broadcast. Uh, but Steve Harvey, if you don't know, um, is part of the Merritt Street uh, media family. In fact, uh, he's an equity partner in Merritt Street Media. He and I are partners in the in the mm. network here. Mm. And uh, mm. I, I called Steve uh, <laughs> some time ago and said, hey, let me tell you what I'm doing. And uh, you need to come do this with me. And uh, I described it to him. And what do you think when I called you about this? What? Honestly, man. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I was floored because I mean, y'all look, look, look at me. Doctor Phil calls you. Doctor Phil McGraw. That's who y'all call him. I call him Philly. Philly calls me. You know his track record. You know what he does. And he says, "Hey, man. You know me and you. We've been friends for a long time. I got something for you. I want you to come with me." I want you to be an equity partner in this deal with me. And I want you to, this is what we're going to do. We're going to open up a TV network and we're going to produce TV. And I want you to have a place where you can bring content and ideas and how you really think and feel. I want you to come do it. And I went, I went okay, first of all, are you joking? <laughs> you got to be kidding me, right? Okay, you called me. And so first I'm thinking, okay, okay. First, you know, here's the, here's the crazy part. I know you didn't need no money. That was So that was cool. I was relaxed right there. Because this ain't a dude that, you know, Philly, we don't have a relationship. Well, you, you know how you got people call your house and you go, uh, what the hell they want? Well, he don't want no money. So I said, okay. And then I thought about it. And then I said, so what are you saying, man? I said, hey, man, can you send me something over? I'm, within five minutes, he sent over a whole presentation. I mean, it was so complete pictures of the studio he was building and what it was going to look like when it was finished. And I said, is this dude for real? So I said, so Philly, you just want me to join in with you? He said, man, I ain't thinking nobody else. You it. You it. And I hung the phone up. I called my wife. I said, baby, I just got a call from Philly. She said, how's Robin doing? She, I ain't talk about that right now. Listen to me. Robin had on some shoes the other day. I was going, where are we going with this? What, what, what's happening? And, and 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 next thing you know, I said, "This is what he want me to do." She said, "Okay, so when you going out there?" I said, "Baby, you, I'm just. This is what he want me to do." She said, "Steve, when you, it's doctor, what what you what you want me to tell you? You know I me, mean? stupid things you've done." And I went, "Are you? That's where you gonna go with it now?" And so that was it. And then he sent the stuff over, and I I, I couldn't believe it, man. In all honesty, this is what you call favor. This is, man, when you're going along and God just do a solid for you. This one, you just, this is, see, I can't give nobody credit for this except God because it was no doing of mine. 
it, I didn't call you. I didn't say, hey, Philly, what you working on now? I got a call out of nowhere. It was you. Look, we see each other on vacation. We sitting out talking. This dude just called me and just, here, I want to do this with you. And I was just, I, I was honored, man. Really, really just honored, bro. Well, I, and the reason I called you, and as I've said to you, nobody else. There, there's not anybody else on the list. It's just you and me. I mean, that's it. <laughs> um, because uh, I, I said, I, I take this real serious. And there is, I, I, you and I have a very um, aligned value system uh, from the very beginning. And I've, this is going to sound like mutual admiration society for a few minutes here, mm -hmm. but uh People know know you from what you do and what they see on the air, but I know you as a real person. I know you as a husband and a father mm -hmm. and uh, a, a real person away from the camera and who you are and what you believe and what you've struggled to overcome. And mm -hmm. I, I, I know who you are and I know how much you have to offer uh, to this country and keeping this country on track and online. And, and I, I didn't name this network by accident. I, I didn't reach into a bag and pull out a mm. name merit. This is merit street media, a, as you know. And I think this country is built on hard work and talent and added value. And I, I know that about you. I've known that about you for years and years and years. And it's, it's not about being a victim. It's about sucking it up and doing what you got to do to get ahead. And, and that's, that defines you. We, you and I've talked about it a, a hundred times. And, uh, I, I know what kind of father you are and I know what kind of family man you are. I know, mm. you know, I, I've seen you and Marjorie, we've vacationed together. We've had serious conversations. We problem solved together. Uh, we fought them off at the gates together. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, so uh, I thought there's this is somebody that uh, ha we have shared life experiences and and shared values. And I said, man, this is somebody that uh, I I'll go in the foxhole with. And that's why I picked up the phone and called you. And man, I appreciate it. You know, man, um, you talk about how things are going in this country and everything. You know, look, man. You know, it, it amazes me because I'm, 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 I'm in, I'm, in, I'm a, a middle guy. You know, the, the symbol for this country is an eagle, right? Right. In order for an eagle to fly proper, you got to have a right wing and a left wing. I don't go all the way with what nobody say. I don't. I'm not really the far right guy, and I sure ain't the far left guy. You know, because I like to get it, man, where I care about my family. I care about my grandchildren. I care about my kids, man. And I'm trying to figure out the world that they're going to be in if we keep going at the pace we're going. Can I tell you something I saw online that was really kind of crazy to me? You know, because we have the issue now. We got all this pronoun picking, right? That's cool. But this was a guy, I saw this online that really kind of made me, I, I, I laughed, but it threw me. I had a little boy in front of this table, and they put two Oreo cookies in front of him and put $500 on the other side. They told this little boy to pick. And that little boy was looking at them cookies and looking at that $500. And let me tell you something, man, he was ripped open. I mean, he was gutted because he, them cookies, and that 500, he couldn't quite figure it out. So they doubled down and they put four Oreo cookies in front of him and $1,000. I saw this little boy. He had made up his mind. The ripping was over. It's, it's a done deal. Damn it, four cookies. He picked them four cookies. He was through. He, you had solved it for me. The money or the cookies. And then a lady came up and said, and this is why kids don't need to be picking their sex at school. And I laughed, but that hit me like a hammer, man. I'm finna say, where are we going with all this? Hold up, man. We got to slow down a little bit. 
Because this little boy clearly took them four cookies. Yeah, at the thousand was right here. You know the thousand, you could have bought how many packs of cookies? Yeah. You could have got a bike. <laughs> Boy, you could have got yourself some new school clothes. You could have bought the girl down the street some cookies. You could have bought the Girl Scout box of cookies. You know how many girls you'd have had after that? That boy picked them four cookies. And I said, man, that's, that's what we got to start thinking about. And, you know, man, I'm okay with everybody making whatever decisions they want to make. But you got to be okay when somebody has a counter now. You got to be okay with a counter, too. You know, if, if you're free to think and feel, that's fine and dandy. But you got to be open to the counter now. Because you, you can't publicly think and feel one way and expect publicly not to be thought of another way. And I, I just kind of look at stuff like that, man. And I think it's a fair to be able to talk about stuff like that and say it out loud without, like you say, without cancellation. Because I ain't trying to cancel nobody. You're an adult person, man. Do you. But we got to take a sharp look at where we letting our kids go. Well, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think that we're in a real bad spot when we can't ask questions without getting labeled as a hater or some kind of phobe. We're in a real bad spot when we have people so afraid to speak their mind or ask questions or disagree uh, for fear that they're going to get they're going to get canceled. And I always thought about college as somewhere you went to hear other ideas mm. or you, you, you went to the town square back in the old days where you, you had different points of view and you, you went to hear what they were. Now, that's not the case. If somebody disagrees, they get shouted down. They call it the heckler's veto. Mm. They're, going to, they're going to shout you down where they don't hear the other side. And what I want to do at, at Merritt Street is I want us to own the debate lane. Look, this is where you can come to talk about both sides of an issue and then let people make up their own mind. Yeah, That's what I want our news department to do. You know, you, you turn on one cable news and you hear everything on the right wing. You turn on the other, you hear everything on the left wing. How, here's a novel approach. Let's tell people what happened and shut up. Just tell them what happened and then shut up and let yeah. them make up their mind about whether it's good news or bad news. Yeah. It's an insult to people. We don't need to tell people what to think. We need to tell people how to think. We don't teach kids how to think anymore. We don't teach critical thinking. Let's teach kids how to think instead of what to think. Let them decide what they think. Let's just teach them how to do critical thinking how to reason their way through something and let them decide what they think. They don't need to be told what to think. That's what's happening in college right now. We're, we're teaching kids what to think instead of how to think. We need to teach them how to go through the thought process. Yeah. That's what's important. Yeah. Yeah, man. We, 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 I just want to be able to, you know, look, man, if you have a difference of opinion from me, I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm really, really cool with that, man. You, you don't got to think like me. But I ain't got to think like you either. And hold on, man. I'm going to allow you to say what you want to say, but can I not be allowed to say what I want to say? Now, if my, what I want to say is not lined up with you, why I got to bite the bullet? Why you got to cancel my show? Because it didn't line up with what you said. And, you know, man, that's the trouble that we're having right now, man. And it seems like uh, that, that cancellation thing is winning right now. Yeah, but I think there's starting to be a swing back, and um, I, I I certainly hope that's the case. Am I supposed to do another commercial yeah. here? All right, mm -hmm. yeah. this is live, so I got to do another commercial across this great country, from coast to coast. You've told me about the crossroads we're facing. That's what Steve was just talking about. Uh, that's exactly why I wrote, "We've got issues: How you can stand strong for America's soul and sanity." Now, this book isn't just a conversation starter. It's a roadmap for standing strong in the face of adversity, for embracing our core values when they're needed most. Now, we're talking about real strategies for real people dealing with real issues. And what I'm talking about from navigating the complexities of today's polarized world to fortifying our families. Um, and I, I really think that families in America are under attack right now. So we've got to really focus on 
strengthening our families. And I set forth in the book 10 principles that I think are critical uh, for a healthy society. This is not about politics. I'm not a politician, don't want to be a politician, don't know enough about politics to talk about it. I think most people that talk about politics don't know enough about politics to talk about it. I'm just willing to admit it. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know enough about it, so I don't. But I talk about cultural issues uh, because I do know about that. And I, I think that if people want to, you know, have a conversation about that, this is the place for them to go. And we're going to be, you and I are going to be doing a lot of things that I think impact the family. We've got one great project coming up uh, that I love. Uh, we're going to be doing a thing uh, that you've been at for a long time. We're just going to put it on television and hopefully in inspire people because you work with young men that don't have fathers in their world. They don't have fathers in their life. Uh, and we're going to do, we're going to shoot a retreat about that this yeah. summer, right? Are we going to do that in Georgia? Yeah, you're going to do that at my ranch down yeah. in Georgia. Yeah. Um, it's it's going to be great, man, because it it this this is what I need, because I need people to understand the severity, like you like we talk about. You know, it's one thing to discuss a problem. It's a whole other thing to provide a solution for it, right? You know, if you work for me and you come to me and you go, well, Mr. Harvey, uh, we having a problem right here. If you don't have a fix for it, please don't bring me the problem. Please don't do that to me because I got enough. I got stuff stacked up to here. If I just want to hear what's going wrong, I, you, you, I don't need you to come in here unless you have a fix. We have a problem with our young men today. My my foundation has worked with young girls. Marjorie does the girls, and I do the boys. And this is my 14th or 15th year doing this. And uh, we I've done over 3,000 young men at the ranch personally. I've done 3 million virtually uh, ever since COVID. 3 million young men. I've done 3,000 live that I bring to my ranch. And what I do is I bring young men to my ranch who don't have active fathers in their life. So they're from single parent homes headed up by women. Because I know the daunting task that women have in raising a young boy. Because how do you get this woman to possibly turn this boy into a man? That's got to be tough when you've never been one. So I offer my assistance. And I mean, I get thousands and thousands of requests every year. Uh, this year we'll have 300 boys. Uh, our, our TV network is coming down there this year. Uh, it's, it'll be the week leading up to Father's Day weekend. I picked Father's Day because they don't have them. And uh, I bring a lot of men down there. It's all men volunteers, all male speakers to put the image in front of these young boys they need. And I teach them two things in the five days that I have them. First of all, I fly them all in. They're coming from 15 different cities this year. I fly them all in. I house them. I put them up. I feed them and I clothe them. Now, these young boys learn two things, the principles of manhood and dream building. And, you know, I got some pushback from certain corporations. What about the education? Hold on, my man. Some of these kids go to college. Some of these kids go to the Army. Some of these kids go work at home where, at Lowe's. I got all types of stuff. That ain't, my, that ain't my job. I'm trying to save these young boys' lives. I'm trying to turn boys, I'm trying to turn these boys into better men. And if I can teach them the principles of manhood, to get them to understand hood, that manhood is not a, a video, it ain't a chain, it ain't the size of your rims. It ain't some girls in the background shaking. That ain't got nothing to do with manhood. Real men go to work. Real men obey the law. Real men love God. Real men respect women. Real men go to work every day. See, I got to get that in their head. And if you give them to me for five days, I got a program that's set in stone that is proven to have maximized results. I have turned out of this program young men who are in the military, young men who are managers in department stores. I've turned out young men who are engineers. I've got ministers from this program. 
I've got young men who are in medical school. I've got so many college students. I've got the track record to show you that if you put a dream in front of these young boys and teach them how to dream, see, the dream will inspire you to get an education. That's the problem we have. See, we keep beating these boys over the head talking about go to school, go to school. Why? Why? Let's talk about the dream. I had a young boy uh, four years ago came to the camp and told me he wanted to fly airplanes. He was a D student. Today, this young man is a pilot. Because once you told me that you want to fly planes, I put some pilots in front of him. I put, I got him to go down and get on the airplane with some pilots. And they talked to him. Well, he found out I got to do better in school because I now I need to be good at science and math. Because I put him put the dream in front of him. I got boys, I had two boys that was gangbangers, and these cats was at it, man. It was Crips and the Bloods, and these two boys. I couldn't separate these dudes, man. Every time they saw each other, them two little color rags was at it. Now, one of the little boys, I, I, I couldn't save him. And I can't tell you where he is today. But one of the young boys come back to the camp. He's one of my top uh, junior councilmen, and he's an engineer today. Wow. See, I ain't going to save everybody. I, I ain't no miracle worker. But the church ain't saving everybody either, so hello. But I can get most of these boys on track. And out of the 3,000 that's come to the camp, out of the 3,000, I've only lost one. Wow. Who just wouldn't stay at the camp. And, and when you come down there this summer field and you bring these cameras and we get a real light on this, maybe somebody would turn around and help me with this. Because I spent a lot of money on this ranch myself, Marjorie and I, and bought it and donated it to the foundation for one dollar so I could change these boys' lives down in Barnesville, Georgia. And you know, look, I gotta build some dormitories right now. I put up temporary housing with tents and I bring in the uh, uh, VIP showers and all like this you see on movie sets so they can get them. But I gotta build dormitories down there. I gotta build a theater down there. I, I wanna build a STEM center down there. I wanna build a gymnasium. But um, you bring them cameras, man. Maybe some people understand what yeah, you're doing. Yeah, I, I do want people to see it. We got a video of any of this? Let's roll it. Let's go, baby, let's go. This is what I live for. This is what God made me for, man. I'm living my purpose. All that fame and fortune, it was for this. So I could teach somebody else how to do what I did, or at some level of it. Well, how many boys at a time? Uh, two, two to three hundred each year. Each year, now, all at the same time. All at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> it's his truckload, man. And how old are they? Uh, from thirteen to eighteen. Thirteen to eighteen. And how do they? How do they sign up? How do they? How do you pick the ones that come? Well, they write a letter. Uh huh. They write a letter. You know that lets us know if they're really interested. Now, sometimes, you know, the ones I pick, I pick mostly trouble youth. You know, we got some straight A students down there, mm -hmm. just don't have a father active in their life. And then I got some cats that ain't doing well at all. That's usually who I pick. I want that little boy that look like that they trying to write him off and tell him he ain't gonna be nothing. Cause mm -hmm. I heard that before. And uh and and that's what we get. Yeah. And, we, we, and how long do they stay? Uh they stay about four days. Mm -hmm. Four days. That's all I need to ingrain in them. Mm -hmm. See, it's real easy, man. Because to get to a boy, I know the way. First of all, I want to know what you're dreaming about. And then I want to know what type of girl you want. See, once I find that out, and then, and then I start telling you what this girl going to want, and then that's going to tell you what you're going to need to do, I have their undivided attention. Mm -hmm. Because I know what it's done. It's real simple, man. You, you got to get down to basics like you talk about all the time. You talk about common sense TV. See, y'all, they going about this the wrong way. You know, man. If schools would implement a dream building course, they could save themselves a lot of trouble. Yeah. If you could ask the kids, what do you dream about? You got to stop and talk to your kid every four months about what they dreaming about. If you talk to them about what they dreaming about, what they really want in life, you have their attention. But you can't keep beating them over the head, but you got to go to school. You got to get your lesson, get your lesson. 
That little boy sitting there going, what are you talking about? Mama, we poor. We can't even eat right now. These lights is off. I mean, that's what they dealing with, dealing with some real situation. And then you get out here in this world and you got Instagram and TikTok showing the flash and pizzazz of life without showing what's really happening. And these kids try to find a shortcut to that to that uh, meal ticket, and it ain't one. No, and I, listen, I've talked to so many of these gangbangers, and I've talked to some that have been really up in the hierarchy of the gangs and a few that have gotten out, and they tell me straight up that when they hear me say the number one need in all people is acceptance, um, that that's what the gangs use to turn these kids' heads. They don't have fathers in the home. They don't feel a sense of belonging, and that's what the gangs sell. They say, hey, listen, we got your back. We love you. Mm. You belong here. And here's this big authority figure that's r real powerful to them, and they say, hey, we love you. We'll protect you. This is a family. You belong here. We accept you. And, I mean, it's ride or die. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they say, I'm, I'm in, and that's how they motivate them. And if, some, if somebody will give them an alternative, if somebody will say, look, what's your passion? Let me help you chase your passion. Let me help yeah. you go after that. But a kid that doesn't have a dream, doesn't have a passion, doesn't have hope, how do you ever expect to motivate that young man? you got to <laughs> have – and I say that to adults too. If you don't have a passion in your life, what a horrible existence. Man. If there's nothing you're passionate about in your life, can Man. you imagine? <laughs> How would that be to get up every day and it just be going through the motions, just gray, every day the same as the last? Yeah, man. Nothing you're excited about, nothing you're passionate about. What a terrible way to live. It is. And you know, man, one of the things that helped me is, see, I bring back kids who have graduated from the program to help me with these kids yeah. that sleep in the barracks with them. So when I'm not with them, they going, hey man, listen to me, what this man's saying is right. This is how you get out. I bring ex gang bangers down to talk to the boys. You know, I, I but I tell you, man, I had the police in there one time. I had the police talking to them boys. Whew. They was, they was they, cause they some, they, they some tough kids. Yeah. And uh, one of the questions to the police officers, we're here to serve and protect. And a, a handful of boys kept raising their hand. Why y'all keep killing us, though, man? Why y'all kill us? And that that's a conversation that had to be had. Yeah. And, well, all police don't do that. Yeah, but on the news, this is what we're doing. This is what we see. And this is what we saw before. You know, there was phone cameras and stuff like that out there, too. So it's a real conversation that we have in dealing with real life, man, with some real solutions to it. And you come in there this summer, man, going to be a big a big shot in the arm. I really believe that, man. Well, I can't wait to do it. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to do it. I'm excited to meet these young men. I'm excited to turn the cameras on and, uh, and let people see the amazing work that you're doing and get people to step up and support it. I, I mean, that's what we want. We want people to make it where you can not work with 300 boys, but you can work with 3,000 boys if that's what yeah. you want to do, that you can have the facilities and and do what, it, what, what you want to do to show them that there's something else in life uh, besides what they come from. Because, I mean, some of them come where hope is just, I mean, it's just a word. Bro, man, you know, one of the highlights was last year for me. One of the guys that came back, he's a minister. He came back and he was having prayer out in the lodge with about 50 of the boys. And I, I didn't know what was going on out there. And he just had him in a circle praying. And uh, I looking at the kid and I didn't had recognized it, but I wasn't paying attention because it's so many kids come through the camp. Sometimes they drive down. I don't even ask. Hey, Mr. Hall, I was here four years ago. I know it's camp time. I just came down. And for this dude to be doing that and then helping these cats out, man, it was just such a moving thing. And the program works, man. And, you know, look, man, you know, and you know how it is. <laughs> Hard to ask for money when you're rich. You, 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 ever, you ever tried that? You ever tried to ask? For some money, you rich man. 
That's that's a funky conversation. Yeah. Boy, because first of all, everybody, when you're talking, the, the whole room is doing this here because they think you got it. Why don't you give some more? Well, you know, nobody nobody wants to factor in the factor in the effort. You know, I, I have 100, 100, 100 employees that I got to pay, and I got to pay for the ranch, and I got to pay for this food and all this here. And then I got a company to run, and I got some employees that's waiting on a check. And they just think it's a bottomless pit of money. So yeah. it's kind of hard, and then I'm not, the, I'm not that guy either. It's really hard for me, though, because of my pride level, because I've been pulling myself up by the bootstraps a long time. It's just that I done ran up into, I know 300 boys that just need boots right now. Yeah, skip, exactly. Skip the straps. You yeah, know. and uh, you know, people either help or they won't, and... Uh, you know, if they think it's not the right thing to do, it's not the right thing to do. But we'll ask anyway because the boys deserve it. And, you know, you can't do it for everybody. You can only do so much. Right. And then you got to get some help. Yeah. And um, so we'll ask for some help. I, I, I've never uh, uh, thought I could do everything by myself. You can't do everything by yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but those people that want to help will help and those that don't won't. That's, but uh I think when they see what's happening here, mm. they're going to, want to be part of that. Maybe they give their time, maybe they give their money, uh, whatever. Great. But yeah. we're going to give them a chance to see what's going on. Yeah, that's good work. You know, the thing I love about this conversation is, uh, you know, people love you. They they love your persona. They love your comedy. They 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 love the way you deal with people and uh, that you always uh, interact with them and never in a mean spirited way, even if you're. Uh, cutting up with them, joking, making fun, or whatever. You're, you're always fast to make sure you're the butt of the joke um, instead of at somebody else's expense. But I, I love for people to get to see another side of you and mm -hmm. know what you're really all about and the depth and, and caring that you have and uh, how deep Steve Harvey runs. Because mm -hmm. uh, Steve, Har Steve, Steve Harvey runs deep. Yeah. And I'm glad for people to get to see that. And I'm glad to get a chance to pull the curtain back and let them see who you really are. I appreciate you letting me do it, man. You know, this is my calling, man. Yeah. I'm I'm in the calling part of my life, man. It took me a while to get here. Yeah, I made good money, man. I've had, I've got, I got a great career. You know, we're going to do some wonderful things. Still got some more to come, but it's all, it's all gotten me to this point right here. My purpose is my mama used to tell me something when I was little and I didn't get it. She said, son, one day God going to give you a big house up on the hill. You can't get up on the hill and don't tell nobody else how to get there. Yeah. I didn't know what she was talking about back then. Yeah. I got it now. now. That's what mentoring is all about for you. That's it. I got a house on the hill. Yeah. And now I'm trying to teach as many people as I can how to get up there. And yeah. this mentoring camp is it. And Marriage Street is another part of it, which is going to let me uh, be able to get to a whole lot more people a lot faster, too, man. So I appreciate you picking up that phone and calling me and thanking of your old dog. And, you know, me and you, man, we got a couple of ignorant things. You know, people don't know this about you, but you're the first person's house I ever went over that had electronic toilet. <laughs> and you didn't tell me that it was electronic. Oh, and geez. you told me, you sent me in that bathroom knowing good and hell well you was going to be out there dying laughing. Because as I finished in the bathroom, I was standing there and there was no button or handle to flush. What activates the flush is you step away and then it automatically flushes. Well... I'm standing there for 15 minutes. I'm under this toilet bowl looking for a button because I got to flush this man's toilet because there ain't no way in the world I can walk out of here without flushing this man's toilet. He won't be talking about me. And I knew you was out there laughing at me. I knew it. I knew you was because well, you knew I, I was in there too long. Well, I figures Hillbilly will walk away eventually. Yeah, but I couldn't. God. You know, I told you that it was a simple process. I wasn't going in there for the big one. It's just a little short. I'd be out here, you know, 30, 40 seconds, you know, unload, skeet, skeet, come on out. That's all I'm thinking. Boy, I was in there, I couldn't find that button. And I knew you was out there laughing at because let me tell you what you did. When I came out, you were sitting on the couch. You was just, had your arm folded, you were smiling. 
I said, "Hey, Phil." He said, "You couldn't find the button, could you?" No, you know what he said. He said, "You're gonna you." I, I know what you're going to do. You're going to dip it out of there and sell it on eBay. <laughs> That's what you accused me of. Well, I thought that too. But I want to thank you because now every toilet in my house is that way. And I put them in the guest powder room too, just so I know. And I and when my partners come over from Cleveland, yeah, <laughs> oh, oh, it's, I'm thinking about putting the camera in there. You bring some boys from the hood and just stand out Boy, there. Let me tell you something, man. <laughs> I heard that one guy was in the bathroom. I heard what? Damn. <laughs> the hell go, where the? He was just in there cussing, man. I was outside the door, and then he said, hey, man, you outside laughing? I couldn't help it, man. Well, you know it was Robin that put those in there. It wasn't this this bald-headed hillbilly over here that <laughs> you, put them in there. And then she thought they was just so cute. There's no <laughs> buttons. There's yeah. no handle to flush. I can see Robin doing it. Yeah, now. exactly. She, yeah. They look like little hat boxes and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They're yeah. real cute. Yeah, well, you can't uh, tell where the toilet seat is up or down. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, now that we've enlightened everybody on my toilets, yeah, uh, it's you. time to say goodbye to the first live episode of Fill in the Blanks. And thank you for doing this. Thank you for joining Merritt Street uh, Media's family. We had a hell of a lineup on the stage today, didn't we? Whew. I didn't know, man. Yeah, it was a different kind of money in there. Yeah, we had some we had some players up there, so yeah. that was great. So, listen, everybody, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll be putting up some more content really early, uh, uh, really soon. Uh, I don't know how we can uh, top sitting here with Steve Harvey, uh, but we'll be uh, following this up with some other content. And uh, be looking for Steve and I on Merritt Street Media soon. We got some interesting stuff in the works, don't we? Sure, do. We're going to surprise them. I think yes, you said sir. it well. We're going to knock down some walls. Yeah, man. Let's go. Yeah, two bulls in a china shop. We're going <laughs> to knock down some walls, guys. Thanks so much. 8, 8 p.m. prime time tonight. Yes. Uh, you can watch it tonight, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central. Uh, go to MerrittStreetMedia.com. Check Channel Finder. Put in your zip code. It'll tell you exactly where you can watch it. 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. And you can see... Um, on Steve's fireside chat tomorrow as What's well. That? Fireside chat tomorrow. Oh, yeah. that's right. Tomorrow, and uh, on my fireside tomorrow, chat. I'm going to be uh, Steve's going to be interviewing me, getting even for me interviewing him. Who is going to be good? And uh, you, uh, you have to be gentle tomorrow. Uh, and I'll that's on. Easy. Hang on, hang on, hang on. That's Steve on Steve Harvey uh, Network. That's on the Steve Harvey Network fireside chat uh, tomorrow. And is it going to air tomorrow as well? Yes, it's live. It's live? Yeah. Okay. All right. Be so careful. Fern, what else you got for us before we <laughs> say goodbye? That's it. Steve Harvey Network tomorrow, 12 noon. Uh, Dr. Phil will be my guest. We're going to have a good one. And if you want to feel good, grab some of those. And, of course, if you want to feel good <laughs> at a Walmart near you, the new product, Elevate You. This is a great one right here. This is for your alert and focus. There's a green drink also. It's delicious. And it's one for digestion and one for your immune system. Elevate You is in Walmart today. It's a Steve Harvey special. You want to feel good. That's what she told me to tell you. Now, hold on. What the hell is this? Give me that. Give me this. Yeah. This is this is yours? Yeah. That's is this Walmart. what you were talking to Robin about? Yeah, that's part of it, yeah. Yeah, she was really excited about this. It's delicious. Yeah. So elevate you. And your producer uses it. <laughs> Laferne does? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, she's kind of nutty. <laughs> no, that's just what kidding. it's for. It's no, for she's nutty very health no, she's very health oriented. Um and uh this is this is part of this health journey you've been on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you look good. Uh -huh. You really look like you're very svelte. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. No, you re you really are. You're not at all. No, you, you look so. better than you have in a long time. <laughs> I hate ain't to no tell lie. you. No, that ain't no lie. That's true. I'm actually reverse aging, Phil. Is that what it is? Yeah. I've actually I've actually uh, taken some step back. I've lost thirty pounds. Oh. Yes, that's what I mean. You you're skinnying up. I'm at seventeen point two percent body fat. Mm -hmm. Which for a sixty-seven-year-old dude is pretty, uh, yeah. And it's it's I'm gonna get better. Uh, my goal is maybe 
Uh, 15% body fat. I don't want to say that. I want to say 14, but I'm scared. So let's just leave it at that. I'm just trying to live a long time. I just got this money. So I'm just trying to, you know, summer four last when it really hit. So I'm just trying to stick around. So this is in Walmart. Yes, yeah, in Walmart, man. Really? Yeah. And it's called Elevate You. Yeah. Well, Robin was really excited about this. That's how I know you'll be taking it soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So is she's gonna have this she's gonna have me all over this. Yeah, and I got a green drink and gummies. And it's got a stick pack, and it's just gonna it's just gonna change your whole everything. Well, there's more to it now. You're gonna have to do a little bit more, but that's the beginning. Wow. Yeah. So you have a video about this? Mm -hmm. Huh? Well, play it. Let's All look right. at it. Let's go. Oh, do you? Yeah. I mean, we're here. Let's do it. You know, the problem I was having with this whole green drink mm -hmm. phase that I was going through was the taste, right? I knew that the broccoli, I knew the kale, I knew the spinach was good for me. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't get it down. So when I came to you, what gave you the notion that you could put some chocolate with this? Cause look at this right here. You put this on the plate, show it to somebody, they'll go, what the hell? And you went, yes, what the hell? Mm -hmm. And you put it together. How, how'd it come to you? What? Well, we knew that chocolate was something you really enjoyed, so we were motivated to figure it out. It certainly isn't the flavor profile that normally goes with your greens, but what we decided to do was import chocolate flavors from Europe. And so we imported a ton and tried them out to see how we could get it to actually combine really well. And we found a way to actually combine it, and just a lot of trial and error, and we got it to work. That's actually John Lyons. He's a Harvard scientist, nutritionist. He's a guy from Harvard. He's way smarter than me. I didn't even know what he was talking about. <laughs> so this is this is part of the whole program. Yeah. And, and this is you, you. You've used this to help get out of your comfort zone and Brother. really get into what you're doing. It says Steve Harvey's Elevate You. Yeah. Okay. So why you been holding out on me on this? Well, why you didn't know, you tell me about this before? You know how it is when you got a friend and you're kind of in a competition, you want to try to catch him a little bit. So I wanted to try to get in shape and then bring it to your attention. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah, thanks for caring so deeply about I do. how you know? great a shape I'm in. <laughs> well, yeah. you waited till you built merit before you called me, you know. Like I wasn't there. I didn't I didn't see myself designing no studio or nothing. So Yeah, but you now know. you're gonna design my body, you're gonna turn Robin loose on me. <laughs> Okay. I'm going to turn your wife on you. I know how to do it, man. Is this a gummy? <laughs> yeah, it's a gummy. So I can eat one of these? Yeah, you can eat one. Is, is it going to taste good? Oh, yeah. Let's and, hope so. And your brain, it will focus you. Like, you know how sometimes I can go off? Well, it, it focused me, Dr. Phil. Mm. How you can go off? You know, on tangents. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. You can go off sometimes. Yeah. But she's really smart. I gotta give her that. Right here, like I just chewed that one just now, and I'm like 30 percent smart. Like, really? Yeah. 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 How many of these you eat at a time? I try to eat about 13. Yeah. <laughs> I got. I'm a low number. Well, I just had two, and I feel like I could just tear up a Rubik's cube. <laughs> no, no. This is. It really is. It does taste good. It does. Man. All right. Thank you, brother. Well, Robin. Talk to me about this already. She digs into this and it's serious. Elevate you. It's in Walmart right now. Um, so go get some of this and download the Merit Plus app when you feel smart enough to do it. Okay? Yeah. Thanks for being here, everybody. So long. <laughs>